Good morning. Last week, uh, I, I mean, I'm sorry, a few days ago, right, um, we started with uh, looking at similarities of matrices. And I told you it's an interesting concept because you might have two matrices, B and A, right? And you multiply one of these with another matrix, P over minus 1 and P, and you can find another matrix. Now, if this was a scalar, these P's would cancel, right? The P matrix would cancel, but it doesn't because it's a matrix. So there's something that is similar between A and B. What's similar is that you might get a totally different matrix in appearance, but the eigenvalues will be the same. So I told you this is sometimes useful because you might want to transform one matrix to another matrix with the same eigenvalues for several reasons we'll see later, okay? And another thing about that is that the eigenvalues are the same and the eigenvectors are also um, have a relation in terms of the eigenvectors. It's p over minus 1 times x of b. So this is kind of an interesting property uh, and uh, we will be talking about similar matrices later a little bit more. Um, why this happens, why the eigenvalues are the same and the eigenvectors are in this following form, I have a proof in this, in this document uh, over which I really don't want to go into right now. Uh, another interesting fact about similar matrices is that the determinants of similar matrices are the same. I mean, it's quite amazing. You might have a large matrix, uh, 5 by 5, 10 by 10, right? And if they are similar, they might look very different, but the determinant is the same. And that is another proof that you might want to look up later. So I kind of want to go quickly through this so that we can actually go into the class rather rapidly. Um, this is another topic. Uh, it's called the diagonal form of a matrix. Uh, let's read through it. It says, suppose a square matrix A has n linearly independent eigenvectors. Okay, so which means uh, the geometric multiplicity is good enough to say that we have n independent eigenvectors. Then if these vectors are chosen to be the columns of a matrix S, it follows that S over minus 1 A, S is equal to a new matrix and that looks like this which has eigenvalues in the bottom, uh, in, in, in its diagonal. Now this is an interesting property. First of all, S over minus 1 times A times S is obviously a Similarity transformation, right? It, it makes it a similarity matrix. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that we are trying to obtain a new matrix where S over minus 1 times S times S, right? That's a similarity transformation. These two matrices will be similar, right? According to, which means that this matrix and this matrix will have the same eigenvalues, right? So, here's the interesting thing. You take the A matrix, find the eigenvalues, uh, I'm sorry, the eigenvectors, right? Okay, you find the eigenvectors. Write these eigenvectors in terms of columns into a matrix, okay? Call this one S. Take the inverse, multiply it with S, and you get a similar matrix on the other side, which have, of, of course, the same eigenvalues, but more than that, the eigenvalues appear in the diagonal and everything else is zero. It's quite amazing, isn't it? <coughs> and this is very useful, which means without even going to the eigenvector business or without even going into finding the S matrix, Without even doing all this, if you have an A matrix that has n independent eigenvectors, you can immediately write a matrix in this form, right, and say this is similar to this, okay? So without, you don't have to calculate S. You don't have to calculate the eigenvectors. You don't have to calculate the inverse. If you know that the A matrix has a being uh, having a size of n, okay, and it has n independent eigenvectors, you immediately can say that there exists a matrix that is similar to A where the eigenvalues 
are in the diagonal of the matrix and everything else is zero and these two matrices are similar. Now this is a very useful matrix here if you see. If you, if you, I mean, you, you realize this is quite significant because it's all a diagonal matrix, right? It says only diagonals and the eigenvalues are in the diagonal. So this, this could be useful for a lot of things which we will be hopefully seeing in this semester where this could be used, okay? All right, if A has no repeated eigenvalues, eigenvectors are independent, obviously, right? If the algebraic multiplicity of one for each one of them, so the geometric multiplicity will also be ones. So therefore, if you have, if, if, if a four by four matrix has four independent eigenvalues, by definition, you will have four different eigenvectors, right? Independent. Therefore, any matrix with distinct eigenvalues can be diagonalized. <coughs> Not all matrices are diagonalizable. We need n independent eigenvectors for a matrix A of dimension n. So, <coughs> if for some reason the eigenvectors are, if you don't have enough independent eigenvectors, you cannot do this. Okay? So. If eigenvectors x1, x2, x3, xn correspond to different eigenvalues, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda n, then these eigenvectors are for sure linearly independent. Recall the example from the previous thing that we have done and it gives you some sort of a solution. You can look at this rather at home. Um, it tries to diagonalize it and so on and so forth. I really don't want to go through this proof since we are running a little bit too long on this review part. I want to go into the controls, into the control problems rather quickly. Okay, similarity transformations. Now, this, this was the obvious one, right? This is the easy one. You have n independent eigenvectors. You can, um, uh, you can transform a matrix into a diagonal form. But there are other ones. There are other similarity transformations, famous similarity transformations, let's just say, okay? A transformation of matrix A does not always have to be in the form of S over minus 1 AS with eigenvectors as columns for the matrix S that results in a diagonal matrix. We might want to transform A into a special form or A might not have independent eigenvectors. So we will call it a transformation of M over minus 1 AM. So it could be, I mean, as long as you can find such matrices, you can always find a similar matrix. But what you're trying to do is you want to transform it into something meaningful, of course, right? I mean, if you have uh, matrix A and you have just another uh, similar matrix, which is totally uh, useless, let's just say, it doesn't make any sense. Why would I transform this useless matrix to another useless matrix, right? You want to transform this matrix into a form that is quite useful. Now, this is one of the examples where the similarity transformation is actually very useful, right? But there are other useful transformations like that. So this is, in this, in this little piece, I, I kind of put together the most important ones, all right? It will still have the same properties of similar matrices, except the resulting matrix might not be diagonal anymore, okay? This is a very nice property where you have diagonals and the eigenvalues are in the diagonal. It might not appear like that, but it might be similar to this. Um, I have an example here. The first one I want to talk about is the sure form of a matrix. Okay? The sure form of a matrix. For any square matrix A, there is an invertible matrix M such that M equals U, meaning U, U over minus 1 AU equals T, is upper triangular. The eigenvalues of A are shared with the matrix T and appear in its main diagonal. So, for any matrix A, now you don't need these independent eigenvectors anymore. You can't do this, right? You can't do this. You have zeros here and zeros here. If you can't do this, the clo another form of this for any matrix A is that you could generate something like this, which means it is, it is uh, a triangular matrix with the eigenvalues in the diagonal. You will have numbers over here, but you will have zeros over here, okay? There is no easy way to find U, but the sure form is used in many theoretical proofs, which means 
I can, uh, any matrix A, I can't put in this form. I need to have independent eigenvectors. But if I don't have it, then the best thing I can do is actually I can do this. I can say at least I can put it into a triangular form. So why more might that be useful? Well, in a lot of theoretical proof, it turns out it is quite useful. If you have zeros on one side, on the, on the lower triangle or on the upper triangle, it is quite useful. Sometimes people ask me, so OK, how do you find u? Well, oftentimes you don't have to. Oftentimes you don't have, even have to know these numbers. So, okay? In a lot of theoretical proofs, you can say this is similar to this, therefore this will cancel, this will cancel, blah, 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 and this is the result. So it's, it, is, it is a way of using uh, this theory in different ways. Okay? So if you become a master in linear algebra or in control theory or look at proofs in mathematics, you will find ways to use this fact to prove things. Okay? But I just wanted you to know about this. I mean, just I want you to have heard about this. There's something called the sure form of a matrix, which is very frequently used. It is nothing but a similarity transformation. Okay? When someone says, this is a sure form of a matrix, you have to know that it's a similarity transformation. So what is it? Well, it is just a transformation, the way we described. Eigenvalues are the same. Eigenvectors are, uh, have a certain relationship. Eigenvalues here in the similar matrix are in the diagonal. Zero on one side, and on the other half, there's nothing. And um, there are numbers, right? <coughs> okay, sure form of a matrix. So you want to remember that, okay? The diagonal form. Just going to write this down. So this was a similarity transformation. Second one is the sure form of a matrix. Okay? So let's go, go down the list. What else do I have? <coughs> Single value decomposition. Let A be of order M cross N. <coughs> so, <coughs> I'm sorry, it, this doesn't even have to be a square matrix now. Then there exists matrices U and V of order M and N respectively, such that V over minus 1 A times U is equal to F, where F is a diagonal matrix of order M cross N. Okay? The numbers here, which appear in a diagonal, are called singular values of A. They are real and positive and can be arranged such that the largest one is on the top and they slowly decrease to the bottom. R is the rank of the matrix A. Good. Here's my question to you. Is this a similarity transformation? <coughs> what do you say? Is this a similarity transformation? You should know this by now. No. no, obviously not. Because you're multiplying the A matrix with two different matrices, V over minus 1 and A. Okay? The similarities transformation asks to multiply this matrix with the same matrix and its inverse. If there are two different matrices, it's meaningless, right? So this is not a similarity transformation. Okay? Singular value decomposition. Do my, you might have have heard about this in your linear algebra class, okay? It is basically saying that you, if you multiply the matrix A left and right with two matrices, you could arrange this F matrix in this particular form where you have certain numbers in the diagonal we call singular values. Now the singular values by itself as it looks here seem to be, I would say, useless. Why would you need something like that? Multiply a matrix left and right and obtain a diagonal with zeros on the upper and lower triangular. And you can arrange the singular values in a certain way. Why would that be significant? Turns out, in linear algebra, in control theory, in a lot of applications, these numbers become quite useful because they signify something in control theory. Okay. Right now, it is just mathematical hocus-pocus. I understand. It doesn't look very... Um, I mean, you might ask yourself, why am I, where am I going to use this? Well, hopefully, I will show you a few applications. Okay? You just have to... But you have to understand, this is not a similarity transformation because it is not the same matrix that you're multiplying. All right? Understood? 
Okay, final one, probably the most famous one, <coughs> is the Jordan decomposition or the Jordan canonical form. Okay? The Jordan form allows any matrix A to transform to a matrix that is nearly as diagonal as possible. Okay? As possible, as, as close to uh, 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 a diagonal as possible. Now, if the matrix has independent and independent eigenvectors, then you can get a very nice diagonal form. But what if you don't have n independent eigenvectors? Then you can do this, but the closest thing you can get is actually the Jordan decomposition, and it is a similarity transformation. Okay? So that's why it is significant. It brings it as close as possible to this diagonal form. All right? And this is true for any matrix A. Of course, the A matrix must be symmetric in, all, in, all, in the cases that we use here. If A has a full set of independent eigenvectors, we arrive, blah, blah, this. So if you do the Jordan decomposition and you have n independent eigenvectors, this would be the Jordan decomposition for, um, for a matrix with n independent, n independent eigenvectors. Okay? So it's a similarity transformation, it's the Jordan uh, canonical form or the Jordan decomposition. The Jordan form coincides with the diagonal of that matrix. However, this is not possible for defective matrices. I don't want to use that term very much, it's still there. Let's just say matrices that don't have enough independent eigenvectors. But the Jordan form allows a near diagonal similarity transformation even for matrices with uh, not enough independent eigenvectors. Theorem. If A has n independent eigenvectors, it is similar to a matrix with S blocks and the form will look like this. So each of these J's are blocks. You see it is a similarity transformation. Each of the Jordan block is a triangular matrix with only a single eigenvalue <coughs> and one eigenvector. When I give examples, I think this will be very clear. When the block has an order greater than 1, the eigenvalue lambda 1 is repeated m times and there are m minus 1 1's about the diagonal. The same eigenvalue lambda i may appear in several blocks if it corresponds to several different eigenvectors. Two matrices are similar if they share the same Jordan form, J. Example 1, consider 5 by 5 matrix with the following eigenvalue and eigenvector properties. Okay, now we have a matrix A which is a 5 by 5, okay, and it has a double eigenvalue, lambda 1, lambda 2, so we found two eigenvalues, 8, with only one associated eigenvector, so they all point in the same direction, there is one eigenvector with this, okay, and lambda 3 is equal to lambda 4 is equal to lambda 5, and that is equal to zero, and it has two eigenvectors. Two associated eigenvectors. This is a five by five matrix. How many eigenvalues do I have? Obviously five, I mean two different eigenvectors, but they coincide. And as I explained last time, this doesn't really mean that we have only two eigenvectors. It might happen you have more. How many eigenvectors do I have? Actually, totally I have three eigenvectors, which means two of the other eigenvectors, they coincide with the other two, right? Okay, so what's the algebraic multiplicity of this one? Two. two. Geometric, one. one. Here, three. Geometric, two. Okay, good. So, which means actually two of them will will coincide, uh, uh, two of the eigenvalues will be um, associated with these two eigenvectors and one of them is a repeated one really, okay? And here they are repeated so it's one eigenvalue, so losing one over here. So here's how we do the Jordan form. We say, you take the A matrix, okay? You multiply it left and right 
with a matrix P over minus 1 and P and obtain a new matrix J. We will call the Jordan form. Now, this is a similarity transformation, obviously, right? This is a similarity transformation. So I don't care what, P, what the matrix P really is. I just know I can find matrices P, I can find a matrix P that would make a tr similarity transformation of A to a form that is called J or the Jordan form, okay? So what would this J look like if I would find the appropriate piece? It would look like this. And this is kind of the rule that we, that we have here. We say we have two eigenvectors. In other words, let's put it this way. We have three independent eigenvectors, okay? Which means we will have three what we call Jordan blocks. We will have three Jordan blocks. Everything else will be zero, okay? So what will be in these Jordan blocks? First of all, one for this eigenvector, we will have two times repeated eigenvalues. So it will be eight, eight, okay? And on top you put a one, and here you put a zero, okay? Always a one at the top and a zero at the bottom. Okay, that's Jordan block number one. Second one, let's say for one eigenvector, one of them is associated with zeros, two zeros, zero, zero, okay? On top you put a one and a zero at the bottom. These zeros come because of the fact that these are zeros. <coughs> and at the bottom, there's only one left, one eigenvector left, and, there, and one eigenvalue is left, so you put a zero away. <coughs> okay? So the, the diagonal of this matrix looks like this. This is the diagonal. And look at the diagonal. The diagonal has all the eigenvalues. It has 8, 8, 0, 0, 0. Quite similar to this. Except you have these 1 and 1 over here. Everything else, everything else will be zeros. One, two, it's for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it's like this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2. <coughs> anyway, okay. Zeros everywhere else. Is this a diagonal matrix? Not really, but it's very close. It has only a, two ones over here, right? So the, and this is true now for a matrix that has not enough independent eigenvector, eigenvectors. If we had in five independent eigenvectors, this would be a, we would not have these ones and we would have five independent Jordan blocks and they would all be aligned over here. Yes? <coughs> this one here? Yes. Well, for the zeros, I need two independent Jordan blocks, right? For sure, two. So, since I have only three, one must have two of them, and the other one will, needs to have the other one. So, for these two, I have zero, zero, and one, so they coincide. And the third one is left alone, which means it belongs probably to that other eigenvector. So you might want to think of this like that. One eigenvector, it's like that. Two eigenvectors, one and two, okay? So this eigenvector, since you have two eigenvalues, you probably have two eigenvectors pointing in the same direction. So therefore you have a Jordan block because they point in the same direction, one, one. Here you have two eigenvectors, but you have three eigenvalues, which means one of them is coinciding to the, which, with the other. So this is zero, zero is coinciding with these two, and the third zero is left alone. Therefore, it's left alone here. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we want P have another eigenvalue, uh, just not P is only one. Uh, mm -hmm. Will it be like the bottom zero? Yeah. You just put it on the diagonal, right? Yeah, of course. Let, let's do another example. Yeah. Let, let me do a few more examples, then it will become clearer, okay? Let me do a few more examples. Let's say I have a four by four matrix, okay? And lambda one is three, lambda two is uh, four, 
lambda 3 is 5, lambda, uh, let's do it like this, I'm sorry. Lambda 2 is uh, 4, lambda 3 and 4 is equal to 5, okay? For lambda 1, obviously, it must be associated with an eigenvector, so there's one eigenvector for lambda 1. For lambda 2, I have one eigenvector, so that's fine. For lambda 3 and 4, it's equal to 5. Now you need to ask me, is, are these associated, is this 5? It is repeated two times. I mean, maybe I should write it like this. Um, lambda 3 is equal to lambda 4, okay? So now you might ask me, well, you have lambda 3 and lambda 4, but as we talked about in the previous class, well, what does this really mean? Does it mean that there is one eigenvector and they both point in the same direction? Or does it mean that you have two independent eigenvectors and these two just happen to have an eigenvalue of 5? So which one is it? Right? You have to ask me. I have to tell you. Let's just say in this problem that lambda 3 and lambda 4 is associated with only one eigenvector, which means they are both pointing in the same direction, okay? Which means algebraic multiplicity is 2, geometric multiplicity is 1, okay? So if the geometric multiplicity was also 2, it would be equal and it would be a full matrix. Let's find the Jordan form for this one. J. How many independent eigenvectors do I have? Three. Therefore, I will have three Jordan blocks. <coughs> okay? First one is three. Not repeated eigenvalue, it's only one, you have a three. Okay? Second one, four independent eigenvectors, not repeated, four. Third one is repeated two times, and it's both are pointing in the same direction. And because they point in the same direction, I would have to do this, 5, 5, <coughs> 1, 0. And everything else will be zeros. And in the middle, I still have, sorry, <coughs> I still have this diagonal. I have the eigenvalues in the diagonal, okay? Let's do the same problem like this. A4 four cross 4, lambda 1 is 3, lambda 2 is 4, Lambda 3 is equal to lambda 5, uh, 4, I'm sorry, is equal to 5. And the geometric multiplicity is also 2, which means there are two independent eigenvectors associated with this 5. Okay? Two eigenvectors associated with 5. Okay? So what would it look like? You have one eigenvector over here. One eigenvector over here, one eigenvector over here, and one eigenvector over here. How many eigenvectors do we have? Four, right? Four eigenvectors. What's the size of the matrix? Four. So a four by four matrix has the full range of eigenvectors. It says four independent eigenvectors. Okay, so let's do the Jordan form. One eigenvector. How many Jordan blocks will I have? Four, right? Because we have four independent eigenvectors. Okay, first one, three. Second one, four, just like there. The third one has five. It's repeated itself, but they are correspond to different eigenvectors. Therefore, one, five over here, five over here. Four eigen <coughs> Jordan blocks, all like this. Everything else, zeros. And look what happened. We have all the eigenvalues in the diagonal. So it turned into itself the diagonal form of a matrix that we had a few moments ago. You see? So the Jordan form, if you have enough independent eigenvectors, is by definition, right, the diagonal form itself. But let's say you don't have enough eigenvectors. Here you had only three eigenvectors. So one, one of the eigenvectors were actually aligned, right? Then you have a Jordan block, which is similar to this. It's quite similar. Look at the matrix. The only difference is this one here. Yes? Uh, is it still valid if you switch the uh, 
Yes. Yeah. So, so now I, I write this in this order. You have three, four like this, but you don't have to be in this order. It could be reversed order. It doesn't matter because I'm making this up, right? Who says this is the first eigenvalue? This could be the fifth, third, whatever. So, yes, each of them are valid. So you can switch the order. It will still be the Jordan form. It will still be a similar matrix. They will, this will still have the same eigenvalue as the original matrix A. Okay? And the eigenve eigenvector relationship is the way we, we defined previously. Where? Here? Okay, let's do that example. Um, gotta remove this one probably. <coughs> so the question is, in this problem, you say we have lambda 1, lambda 2 is 8, lambda 3, lambda 4, lambda 5 is equal to 0. Here you have one associated eigenvector, and here you have another associated eigenvector, right? Which means you have two independent eigenvectors for a 5 by 5 matrix. That means you will have how many uh, Jordan blocks? Two, right? So let's do this. And the second one will be a little bit bigger. Let's look at the first one. The first one is the same, so it will be 8, 1, 0, 8, all right? And the third one will be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. You will have the ones on the top. And you will have three eigenvalues repeated itself. And you will have two Jordan blocks because of the two independent eigenvectors. All right? And <coughs> here are your eigenvalues. Still on the diagonal. The only difference between the diagonal is that you have one over here, one over here, one over here. Okay? So, what are we saying here? We are saying the following. There will be a matrix P such that you can transform this A into this form if you give me this information. <coughs> Eigenvalue and eigenvector information. I know this matrix. I don't have to know these matrices. I don't have to calculate p and p over minus one. I mean, there are ways to calculate, but I don't have to calculate them. I know there are matrices p that will transform A into this form, and this is as close as it gets to the diagonal form. If everything, if you have enough independent eigenvectors, in fact, it is a diagonal form. But if there, are, if you don't have enough eigenvectors, then you will have a few ones on top and it will turn into itself into the Jordan form. Okay? So when you are trying to make a similarity transformation to the Jordan form, you are always kind of safe that you come as close as possible to a, di to a diagonal form. Okay? Therefore, this is quite popular, again, in proofs, in mathematics, in, 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 in theoretical uh, analysis, and so on and so forth. Here's, of course, one thing that I want you to remember as, a, as an engineer, okay? <coughs> to get, um, you know, let me put it this way. <coughs> Let's say you have a matrix four by four, right? Here, we just talked about this. Let's say you have four by four. One, two, three, four, five, six, and I don't know, you have some other numbers over here. Okay? And this is now a three by three. Okay. So you might say, <coughs> whatever these numbers are, I don't know, I just make this up. You might say, this matrix has not enough. Eigen repeated uh, has not enough eigenvectors, therefore I cannot put it into a diagonal form. Therefore, the best thing I can do with this matrix is I can put it into the Jordan form. Okay? Good. So, therefore, this A matrix, I don't like it very much because I cannot put it in a nice diagonal form. Unfortunately, I'm left with the Jordan form. Well, in engineering, you put this 1.01, .01 and suddenly everything is green again. 
suddenly you don't have these repeated eigenvectors anymore. Suddenly you can actually put it into a diagonal form because they are not really uh, exactly aligned, the eigenvectors. Okay? So from an engineering point of view, okay, when you do measurements, let's say, and you linearize your equations right, in, in, in aerospace, in order to get a perfectly aligned eigenvector is, exa is, is really not that easy. Okay? You need the perfect combination of numbers to have repeated eigenvectors. So from an engineering point of view, in engineering we do a lot of approximations everywhere, right? When we do real life applications, we do a lot of funny approximations. So if I would make this kind of approximation and I suddenly have enough eigenvectors and I can diagonalize everything, then you might also claim that the Jordan form is really something, if you have something really, really precise, which in aerospace is sometimes not easy to achieve. Okay. Why is it not easy to achieve? Why can't we be very precise in everything we do in aerospace? Why is, you know, if you measure a velocity on the pitot tube, okay, you me measure something like, I don't know, 300 knots. And you measure, you look at it, it's a 300, 0, 0, 0. Can you be sure that it's exactly 300 knots some, from the measurement of the pitot tube? What would you say? Do you ever try to measure anything from a pitot tube? I mean, the, the air, the movement of the air is never as perfect, as ideal, as one might describe in its models. The air will always have some wakes, turbulence, this, that, separations, tur you know, all this stuff. So the measurements will never be exact. They will always be a little playing around, not really sure, hopefully it's okay. You know, if, you are, <clears throat> if you have ever done flight tests, measurement of angle of attack, measurement of side slip angles, measurement of airspeed, all these things, they are always a little bit not really sure. I mean, hopefully they are okay. I mean, they are, you know, let's, let's put a few more sensors, make sure that we actually measure the right thing. So this kind of significance here, 2 versus 2.1, 2 versus 2.101. I mean, from a practical or engineering point of view, it's actually a lot of these things are negligible, which means you can always design this A matrix such that you can go to a perfect thing like that. Okay? So I will give you problems right, in this class, and I will tell you this is the number, these are the numbers. And, and some, some, sometimes they will not have enough eigenvectors right, in, the, in, the, in the exam. And I will tell you, okay, diagonalize it. And you will see, oh, you cannot diagonalize it, it doesn't have enough eigenvectors. Let's put it in the Jordan form. Well, the fact is that the matrix that I give you will never be um, as perfectly measured in real life. Okay? And engineers usually put a 0 0.1 somewhere and suddenly everything is green again and you don't have this eigenvector matching or any of these things. Understand my point? So these things are mathematically very correct, very important. You have to know these things. But you have to also realize that you're still engineers. Okay? It's a little bit different from being a mathematician. You need to know mathematics very well. That's why we go through this. But engineering is um, somewhat different. Your job is to make flying objects. Your job is to make airplanes. So do it the way you can, the best. Yes? So how do you decide the ending part? Like this one? Yeah, for example. Oh, that, that's what an engineer is. An engineer knows where to do the right assumptions and where to ignore things, where to neglect things, and where to not neglect things, where to add things, where to subtract things, and how much and how little. That's why people pay you money. Okay? That's what an engineer is. In order to do this, you need to have a through understanding of physics, of the physics of the flight, of your engineering, and also have a through understanding of mathematics. 
then you can make these intelligent decisions. If it was this easy for anybody, then anyone could do it, okay? You're putting a 1.1, so is this significant? Now I will ask you as an engineer, you see? I mean, of course it's dangerous if you put a 1.1 here that is, makes a huge difference in the result, but you need to know where to put that, where to play around with numbers, all right? That's why you need all of this stuff. You need to understand it, okay? So the Jordan form is another similarity transformation which is very, very popular, okay? There are many other similarity transformations. You might want to go and look at math books and linear algebra books, but I just wanted you to know what a similarity transformation is and at least have heard of these ones and understand what they, what they are and what they could be used for. And in this class, hopefully, we will be using this one or two times in some of the applications. Okay? So I suggest we give a five-minute break. Don't make it too long and come back. What time is it? Towards two. two. Okay, maybe we continue. Okay, all right, let's continue. Um, all right, so this is the end of my, uh, of this linear algebra stuff. And um, you can, I will put this on the web so you can read through this and look at the proofs and some of the examples. <coughs> okay, so this last half hour, I would like to spend um, talking about something you probably already know, but it will, I, I will try to go as quick as possible on this thing. It's uh, the state space representation of dynamic <coughs> systems. Okay. This is something I have done truly in, in flight mechanics, right? And, uh, but let me just quickly review all this quickly review all this. When we <coughs> mathematically express uh, a, a motion, whether it's a pendulum, it's a ball you throw in the air, an airplane that flies, a rocket, whatever, a dynamic system, if you express it mathematically, you express it with, dynamic, with uh, differential equations. Differential equations in the sense that everything happens with respect to time, Therefore, the equations must be a function of time, right? If I express uh, a movement of a dynamic system in time, right, it, it has to be reflected in the <coughs> equations. And therefore, the differential equations that we use to describe motion are there's a derivative with respect to time always somewhere because this tells you how much this moves as time goes by, okay? And the easiest way to, the most compact form to express such a thing is through differential equations. So this one we call x dot, okay? And x being the state of the system. For airplanes, if you remember from flight mechanics, we said the state of a, a rigid body airplane, right, let's say, you remember some of the numbers, what, what states we had? We had the th three velocities in the body axis, right? We had the angular velocities, PQR, and then we had the angles, theta and phi. <coughs> remember? <coughs> These were the states for the airplane. And then in flight mechanics, if you recall, we actually took the derivative of this. You had u dot equation, you had a v dot equals blah, blah. You had a w dot equals blah, blah. Remember that in flight mechanics? If you don't remember, as I said, uh, Fortunately, they're all on the web. You can go back and listen to those things. So x, they are functions, okay? Now, this is a vector. This is supposed to be a vector, so this is a vector function. The x is a function of x's, meaning the states, but also the controls, remember? 
you were the controls. <coughs> For an airplane, the controls were things like the pilot controls, the aileron, the elevator, the pedal, uh, the, the, the throttle, you know, right? These were the controls of the pilot. So x dot as a function of time were functions of these things. So and they were nonlinear functions. Okay? They were nonlinear functions. Usually the number of states, right, are not necessarily equal to the number of controls. Okay? <coughs> and here we would express this in and say you have um, n states, you have n uh, number of the first order differential equations of first order differential equations, okay? And sometimes we say the output of the system might not be necessarily the states. The states are used to drive the system. Okay? The output might be actually something else. The item output might be, I don't know, you might have a sensor that measures something crazy. It might measure something like this. I'm just saying it might measure the magnitude of the total velocity vector. This might be your output. I mean, you might have a sensor that is not measuring u, v, and w, but it might just measure this, okay? So the output of the system or the thing you measure might not be necessarily the states. It doesn't mean the states don't drive this equation. This, this, this system will, these states will drive the system. In order to describe the system, you need these states. But this doesn't mean the output must be the states. You might actually not measure these things at all. You might be measuring something totally different and you might be only interested in this. <coughs> Basically, you might be, think of a box, right? And let's say you have some inputs and let's say the only thing you measure is this and the only thing that you are really interested in is this. I'm just giving this hypothetically as an example. Think of a scenario where the inputs for the airplane is this, and the output is the magnitude of the velocity, and that's what I only measure, and I ask the pilot to, to only and only look at this number and make sure that this number is a certain value. The rest, I said, don't care. You might be going upside down, you might be going up, down, don't care. Well, the movement of the airplane is still governed through these equations. Okay? So, governing the equations, basically the movement of the physics, I mean the, 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 the physical movement, the description of the physical movement is described through the states. Okay? But the output can be something totally different. So we usually say the output, y, can be a function, again a nonlinear function, of x and even u. Okay? And we call this y output. All right? And inside, what happens inside? Well, inside we have this. x dot as a function of time is a function of x and u, right? And the output, y, comes from g, is a function of x and u. Which means we could actually plot u the input as a function of time, and we could plot y t as a function of time. So if you look at this, y is not a differential equation. So why can, am I plotting this as a function of time? y isn't, but x is. And so is u. They are both functions of time. Therefore, y is a function of time. And it is the output. It might so happen that it might so happen that it's a special case where y is equal to x. This is a special case. Okay. 
Okay? In that case, yes, the output is u, input is u, and the output is x. Which means we are measuring everything on the airplane. We are measuring all of these states from the airplane, and that's your output. And we give it to the pilot and say, or to the operator, whatever, and say, these are the outputs. The outputs are equal to the states. It's a special case. So which means y is equal to x. It doesn't have to. It can be this. But what happens inside, how the airplane is moved, is still described by this equation. OK? It's still described by this equation. So this box will still have the same thing. x dot is equal to fx comma u. And the output is still y equal to x. OK? Both are airplanes. Both do the same movement if you give the same input. What's measured, or what I am interested in, is just different. Here I'm only looking at this. Here I'm looking at the whole vector. OK? Therefore, I want you to distinguish between an output of the system and the states of the system. The states are the parameters or the variables that are required to describe the motion. States are the variables that are used to describe the motion. Output is whatever I feel is the output, or whatever I measure in real life, whatever I ask the pilot, the controller to do. That's, that's the output. Let me give you another example. These are states here that we have obtained in flight mechanics, right? Three axis velocities, angular velocities, angles, and stuff like that. Well, this is for a rigid body. <coughs> the plane is rigid. In real life, the, fla the, 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 the wings, they actually move, right? Called flutter, right, when they, when they move. So because they are moving, they will change the angle of attack, right? They will, therefore, the angle of attack will change, and therefore, maybe some of the angle of velocities will change. So, so this movement of the thing has actually an effect. So why am I not including this here? Well, you might say I'm neglecting it, all right? In my equations, we did neglect it, that's right. But in real life, when we give these numbers to the pilot, we never tell him how much flutter he has on his, on his wing. Do we tell the pilot? Your, blade is, your, your wing is going up uh, 10 centimeters, 20 centimeters. Do we tell him? No. Why not? Well, it's happening. It is changing the movement of the airplane. But it's not an output that we want to provide to the pilot. Is it there? Yes. Is it changing the dynamics? Yes. So if I want to be very precise in my states of the airplane, I should probably include the movement of the, of the wing. Is it an output to the pilot? No. Is it there? Yes. So what I'm trying to say, that's, so that's a state. The movement of the wing would, uh, would be a state. But it is not an output that I would provide to the pilot using my control system. Sometimes we use it in our control system, the flutter, but OK, let's assume we don't. It's, it's something that's there, but basically, in this particular case, we don't care. That's not to say that we don't care about flutter, OK? Don't get me wrong. Just trying to give you an example. Try to give you another example. Let's say we have a three-dimensional flight of an airplane, OK? So we have six degrees of freedom. We are flying. Good. Let's say we want to design a controller which only takes care of the Dutch roll mode. Remember the Dutch roll mode of the airplane that does this? And we want to design a controller that specifically deals with only the Dutch roll mode. So what do we do? We can do two things. We can say the states are still this, but the output will be only the lateral states, and we will try to control them. What happens to the longitudinal? Well, I don't care. It is there, but it's not an output. So you might think of that like this. Or you might do actually something else. You might say, 
Well, the dynamics that is related to the longitudinal mode, I remove them altogether. I don't care what they do. So the dynamics that only I'm going to look at is going to be the lateral dynamics. So you remove half of these things, write only the lateral dynamics into the states, and say the state is still the output, and then you look only at the lateral dynamics. So where am I going with this? You as an engineer, you have to decide what variables will be states and what variables will be outputs. Okay? In order to make the decision, again, you have to understand all these things. You have to understand the physics, the flight mechanics, and then make those decisions. If I tell you to design a controller for Dutch roll mode, okay, and you ignore the, the roll angle, but include the pitch angle, that doesn't make sense, right? Well, how are you going to make that decision? Well, if you're good in flight mechanics, you know which variables to take, to use, which ones to ignore, which ones you want to include here, which ones you want to include here. So in this class, fortunately, for, most, for the most part, I will tell you which states we are going to use in the state space and which we are going to use as an output. I'm just warning you that if you want to be, if you want to be a good controls, uh, control engineer, in aerospace, you have to start by making these intelligent decisions, which actually can only be done by people who understand flight mechanics quite well. Therefore, the area of controls in aerospace is usually called flight mechanics and controls. It's one, one, one package. Because the control theory is the same everywhere, right? But how do you match the flight mechanics with the control theory? All right? that, that's where things become um, important. And maybe to our advantage a little bit too. <coughs> All right. So. This is a nonlinear system. Okay. This is a nonlinear equation. Where do I have it? Here. This one. Nonlinear equation. Okay. And there, so F and G, nonlinear functions. Okay. However, we would like to, in, in, in this class, in modern control, we don't work with the functions f and g. We work with, what do we work with? The linearized versions of these functions. We linearize these functions. Okay? So everything we will be doing in this class will be linearizations of these functions. So, how do we linearize? So, I think I have um, shown this in other classes as well, but let me quickly say, if you had a function like this, what would be a linear version of this function? Sometimes I see students saying that this is the linear version. That's not, that's just an average. When we say linear, a linearization of a function is not even a correct term. You can have a function like this, you can choose a point and linearize around this point. So this would be a linear function around this point of that black function. So we need to choose a point. So you choose this point, so you linearize it. So in a closed neighborhood around this point, this linear curve is actually matching the black curve. When you go a little bit outside, of course, these parts here, they're useless, right? I mean, I'm not going to say useless, but they don't match the actual curve anymore. All right? Similar thing, you know, at certain parts of the curve, they might match a lot better. Maybe you want to choose this point and put a linear linearization here, a, a linear curve here. And this is, this is valid in a la much larger neighborhood. So you're choosing one point where you can linearize. Always choose a point where you linearize. So where can you linearize this? You can linearize this in infinitely many points. You can linearize this anywhere you want. Okay? So there are lots of ways to linearize this function around many points. 
Well, if you again recall, in this case, we are very interested in a special point, and that's the point where we have an equilibrium. The equilibrium point real of x. Okay, which means it is the equilibrium point where x dot is equal to zero. This is a special point. Why is it a special point? Which means nothing is changing in time anymore. That actually corresponds for airplanes to a trimmed flight, right? Where the airplane has a certain state, u, v, w, p, q, r, theta, phi, psi, are all not changing anymore. So the airplane is flying at a constant velocity. And that is what we call a trimmed flight condition. And it is an equilibrium point for an airplane. If I say an airplane is flying at 300 knots in, in wings levels steady flight, we are talking of a flight where x dot is equal to zero. U, V, W is not changing. Velocities are not changing. P, Q, R, angular velocities are not changing. Theta, phi is not changing. So this is your equilibrium point. And we are always interested in that equilibrium point because stability is a property of these equilibrium points. We don't really say an airplane is stable or unstable. We say an airplane has equilibrium points that are stable or unstable. So I can ask you, is a helicopter stable at 120 knots? Steady forward flight. The answer is usually yes. Is the same helicopter st uh, stable in hovering condition? The answer is usually no. It's the same helicopter, two different equilibrium points. At one equilibrium point, it's stable. and the other one, it's not. OK? So all controllers that we are going to design in this course, again, are going to be controllers to stabilize around equilibrium points. We're going to start with stabilizing things. And it will stabilize the system around equilibrium points. So you will have a controller that will stabilize a quadrotor or a helicopter, let's say in hover. You will design a controller that will stabilize the system in, I don't know, 200 knots, 200 knots, whatever, forward flight. OK? So we are interested in this point. And therefore, I'm going to linearize this around this point. Okay, so we are looking at the point where zero is equal to fx comma u. All right. So this is where we're going to look at. And from this, <coughs> hopefully, we will find x zero and u zero are the variables or the controls and the states that will correspond to x dot equals 0. We have done this for steady forward flight, if you recall, in flight mechanics. All right? Good. So how, if I know, now these are my so-called equilibrium points, right? Or the states and the controls at equilibrium. So having this, how can I linearize now the function f? Right? How do I linearize it, a function f? Well, for that, we are using, of course, the Taylor series expansion. And if you do this, I'm not going to go through the Taylor series again, but it will basically look like this. Let's say you have n states, x1 dot, x2 dot, xn dot. So it will look like this. Del f1, del x1, del f1, del x2, del f1, del xn, del f2, del x1, fn, del x1, del fn, del x n multiplied by x1, x2, xn plus do the same thing for the controls. And then 
1 del u m. This is not a square matrix over here. Del f n del u m. And here you have the controls u1, u2, all the way to u m. Okay? And you calculate this matrix, calculate this matrix at x is equal to x0, u is equal to u0. And you do the same thing over here. Multiply, uh, calculate this at x is equal to x0, u is equal to u0. So that this will be a numeric, there will be, numer there will be numbers in this matrix, okay? And this matrix here is n by n. And this one here, we should call it the B matrix, and that is n by m. So the A matrix is, by definition, always a square matrix, right? Because you have n number, n number of states here and here. So it is always a sca uh, uh, state matrix. And it looks like this. So writing this nicely, x dot is equal to A times x plus B times U. And this is what we call a linear state space representation of our nonlinear system. Okay? Is it linearized? Sure. So if you linearize it, what do we have? We have a matrix A, which is a square matrix, and we have B. That's right. That's right. That's right. Every state here, maybe yeah, this is something <coughs> that's important. If you look at the Taylor series, right? All these deltas, they're, they're all, um, let me put it this way. If you had a function of x, you want to have the Taylor series expansion, right? You have f at x0 plus del f del x, x minus x0, right? So therefore, this would be a delta x. And if you move this one to this side, you also have a delta f, right? So what you're having here is really delta x times del f. So all of these x's are still perturbations from the equilibrium point. If you don't remember that, please go back to the videos of last semester for flight mechanics. And look at the title that says small disturbance theory, or that says linearization. OK? Because when you linearize something like this, everything here, there are states, yes, but there are perturbations from the equilibrium point. So basically, here, this x1 would be actually x1 minus x0, right? x minus x0. This one would be x2 minus x0. And because if you want to take the derivative of this, take the derivative, then the derivative will be, if you take the derivative of this thing with respect to time, this will be equal to x1 dot, because this is a constant, right? The equilibrium point is a constant. So on this side, the perturbation or the real value is, is actually the same. Over here, it is not. They have to be perturbations from the small, from the, from the real point. Okay? Please go back to those videos. I'm, I'm so glad I'm doing these videos because I don't have to tell you that you remember. You can actually go back and remember. <laughs> okay? <coughs> well, you can do the same. Uh, I mean, is this, is this fine now? You, you got it? All right. So what we are having here is AX plus BU, OK? So um, you can do the same thing um, for the output, of course. Do the same thing for the output. And you would get something like this. I mean, you do the same thing, right? C, a matrix C times X plus D times U. C being, you know, again, 
um, very similar to that thing, uh, del uh, g uh, del um, x one uh, del g two del x two, etc. Okay, so it's it's the same stuff. And let's say um, y, if y is, um, is also is of size L, in that case, uh, C would be of size L cross N, and D would be a size L cross M. Okay? So, doing all this, Doing all this, we have now the following equations. x dot is equal to ax plus bu, basically that one. And this one, y is equal to cx plus du. And this is the typical state space representation, the linearized state space representation of a dynamic system. In our case, it is linearized around an equilibrium point. And everything we are going to do from now on in this class will use this as a starting point. So all control systems that we are going to design, the state feedback controller, LQR, everything, will design a controller for this. What does this mean? It means your controller is really work perfect only at the equilibrium point. Remember, if you had a function like that, and you want to linearize it around this point, let's say, the linearization is this. Now, this is a two-dimensional system. This is a multi-dimensional system, more than two, right? So therefore, I can't really plot it if, if you have eight variables over here. But if you had two, you could have do, done something like that, right? So that's called x and y, not to confuse or maybe um, M and N, so I'm just making this up, okay? So, this, is, this linearization represents this line, where the real function is this. Which means if you design a controller using this, your controller really works perfect only over here, on that point. And hopefully a good over here and here. But I guarantee you, your controller will not work over here because you're so far away from that thing. Okay? So you always have to keep in mind when we design controllers for this, that this was actually only valid at the point where we linearized it, which was the equilibrium point. Okay? So, and all controllers that you, that you see around, I mean, most of them in industry, they use linear controllers. Le linear controllers meaning controllers for linear systems. Is the system really linear in real life? Well, I hope it is, because if the system was really linear in real life, then I would linearize the system around this point. What would, what would be the linearization of this point of this linear function? It would be the same function, and it would be, would be perfect then I would have only one controller that works everywhere because the system is linear already. If the system is highly nonlinear, we call it, so if it's moving a lot, then your linear controller, or the controller that you design for the linear system, might not work everywhere. It might work at a certain point, but might quickly diverge as you go away from that state. Okay? So what do we do then? Well. We linearize the system around other equilibrium points and design a bunch of controllers and use that controller at that flight condition and use another controller in another flight condition. Okay? Yeah. Don't know. Yes, that's how it goes. Okay? Look at this linear curve. If I would do this, does this remind you of something? It's the CL alpha graph, right? Well, guess what? Fixed-wing airplanes are quite linear. 
Look at CL alpha. I mean, it is quite linear. The, the whole airplane, if you remember from flight mechanics, we could write this CL alpha for the whole airplane, for the whole airplane, not only for the airfoil, for the whole airplane. So for the airplane, we're actually quite lucky. Because unless you go to stall or some weird flight conditions, the airplane is pretty much linear. So oftentimes, a good controller can cover a large range of the flight regime if it's a nicely behaving airplane. I'm not talking about the airplanes with a lot of turbulence and nonlinear behavior, the fighters and all that. But a nicely flying airplane is linear for the most part. So therefore, designing controllers for these fixed wing UAVs that just fly around with a little camera is not really that hard to do because the system is quite linear. It is a little bit harder if you have a quad rotor because that's quite nonlinear. So is a helicopter. Okay? So when we design controllers from now on in the next weeks, Always keep in mind, we will start with this. I will tell you an airplane at blah blah altitude with this velocity, blah blah, has the following linearized set of equations, which means it was nonlinear, we linearized it, blah blah. Okay? And we design a controller for this. And you might always remember that that controller really is not for the airplane, it's for that linearized version of the airplane at the equilibrium point. Therefore, if the airplane is really linear in that region, it will work everywhere else. But if it's not, it might actually diverge after a certain time. And now, who, who is going to make the decision where to design another controller? Well, you. When you become an aerospace engineer, you have to decide where to design a new controller. How do you decide that? Well, you understand the flight mechanics. Maybe you look at the eigenvalues, you look where you are very nonlinear, you look at the equilibrium points and you say, we need a new controller here, here, here. And only people who understand flight mechanics can do that. Okay? Any questions? I just want to make this clear so that from now on, when I start here, we all understand what we are doing. Any questions? Okay. So, see you next week. And we will continue with observability and controllability and hopefully design our first controller maybe next week, maybe the following. All right.